Okay, so I think we can start now. Okay, so I shared the reference photo earlier and this is it. Okay, so um, we're doing a moth for today and um, moths are not as colorful but um, they really camouflage very well when they're against um, plants or tree trunks. The most amazing for me is against tree trunks. It's really amazing how they blend. So I picked one that is not too camouflage. There's some green, but um, I'm sure if you look far, um, it will just look like leaves. So it's perfectly camouflaged still. So when the word camouflage comes to, to your mind, um, what what is the first thing that you imagine or do you see that you would paint, for example? It's, of course, different for all of us. So I had a hard time choosing, actually. I mean, the chameleon would be the most obvious, but um, I think it's too much for a live class. So let's go with the moth. Okay, so um, now I'm going to flip the camera so that um, you can see my um, desk. Okay, let me do that. Okay, so this is it. And then I'll just uh, flip it, don't worry. All right, so I already pre-sketched the moth. As you can see, um, you don't have to draw all the lines of the tree trunk, okay? I just uh, drew the basic shapes around. And I also applied some masking fluid to the legs and to the um, this part of the moth to keep it safe from um, the watercolor later on. So this is probably the last thing that I would work on. So I just applied some masking fluid. Um, you can also apply tape, masking tape, if you have the patience to make it this thin and to shape it, or you can just paint around it. So this is my lazy way. I just put masking fluid so I can just paint over it and not have to worry about it. Okay, so just um, draw the basic shapes and then you're good to go. Right, so I have the reference photo here to the side. And today I'm gonna use Sun Arts Allegro palette because it has all the warm colors. Um, this is the swatch, as you can see. Okay, so this is Allegro palette, it's already very messy. And then your mixing plate, your water. I have a big jar always. And then brushes. So I already set up uh, different kinds of brushes here. Most of the, these are from the Turner collection, also from Zen Art. And some are from the fine line, such as this. Okay. And then you can also prepare your paper towel for absorbing, your paper for swatching your colors before so you can try them out before you paint here and you can also prepare some buds okay so i'm going to zoom in a bit so that you can see closer okay let's see okay there you go all right so uh, before we start if you have any questions just let me know okay or anytime actually if anything comes to mind, just um, let me know and I'll keep checking and answer. Okay, so let's start. So if you if you observe the moth, it's uh, it has like a velvety texture. So let's, I'll try to I'll try my best to replicate that. Okay, so I'll choose a mid-sized round brush. Round brushes are really the best because, um, especially the ones with a good tip, because if you just bend it like that you can draw thick lines and then if you lift it you can draw thin you can paint thin lines so play around with your um, round brush sizes five to seven are great but um, sizes differ across brands so um, don't be surprised if number four looks if it's a bit different than in the number four of another brand okay so um the base color that I see for this moth is um, an olive green, so which is perfect because um, <laughs> Allegro palette has that exact color, olive green, right here. So I'm going to be using that to just shade the whole moth. 
So that will be the first layer. Okay, so that's why I have this swatch always ready. So I can check the intensity of my mixture, if it's too light, if it's too dark. Okay, so I think I can make it a little bit darker. So if you have a pan, you can always um, awaken um, your paints by spraying water on them. So you can do that, you can spray all over and it will um, awaken the paints, keep it, uh, make it moist already. Okay, so now I'm gonna paint all over, but I'm gonna keep this part um, free because it has more white, so I'm going to retain the whiteness. So if you feel like you drew over, your, you painted over the white, um, don't worry. Um, later on, you can always um, paint it over it with gouache, white gouache, since gouache is more opaque. Then it, it will go over your um, watercolors um, perfectly. Or you can also use um, white gel pens. I also use that. And I just, especially for lines, I just draw over those parts that I need to be white. Okay, so I'm just, I started with um, wet and dry, so I didn't wet my paper. This is the first layer. Then I'm gonna do the same to the other side. And I left this part white because this part also has the wider part of the wing. I'm so amazed sometimes at how mo how big moths get, especially um, in the mountainside. They can really get so huge. So. Are you fond of painting insects, for example? If you are, what insects do you usually paint? I guess butterflies would be a, a great choice because they're very colorful if you like to paint with a lot of color. Okay, so that's the first layer. So you don't have to be to go crazy and um, make everything exactly the same as the photo. Remember, your photo is just your reference. It's just there to guide you. You can always make little changes and even add different colorings if you want. Okay, it's your work. So feel free to make it um, your personal style. Okay. So next, um, I'm gonna add brown, okay? So I'll refer to my swatch guide so I can pick the, right, the, the nice brown. I think I'm gonna go with um, a little bit of burnt shanna with burnt umber. I want it to be a little um, warmer brown. Okay, so I'm gonna mix it here. So it's going to be a, a reddish, reddish kind of brown, but not too red. That's why I'm adding some burnt umber to tame the redness a bit. Okay, so I'm going to paint it all over until here where the, the green at the bottom is. So I'm doing it in layers. Then for the dark spots, I'll just add another layer later on. 
And the thing about this painting this moth is you don't have to wait for all the layers to be completely dry because when they bleed it it's actually perfect for the velvety um, soft look of the wings. Okay, and then I'm going to add darker green here already so that they will bleed with each other a little. Again, if you want your green to be brighter, um, go ahead, okay, test it out, play around. After all, um, each artist sees things differently. So whatever you see or you feel like you would like to interpret it in a different way, go ahead. Okay, so while the, the brown part was still wet, I already added um, the green at the bottom so that they will um, kind of bleed with each other. And then you can always um, introduce more water if you want them to sort of spread like that. Then if you feel like you've maybe made it too dark you can always color lift okay so while it's still wet you can still do a lot of things to it okay so depending on your paper some paper um, it absorbs the water and pigment really quickly and while some really give you enough time to play around with your um, work so for this paper um, since I also applied it wetly, it really gave me time to um, add more color, lift color. Okay, so um, try out different kinds of paper because they behave differently. You love butterflies, yes. <laughs> they are beautiful and so varied. You can totally paint a different butterfly each day. Okay, so... I think I'm kind of happy with this side so now I'm gonna go to the other side okay so don't don't stress out if you don't see good things at the start okay uh, don't judge your work before it's finished all right so next I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side add the brown the brown mix that I made I'm working around this part it's just green try to keep it green Okay, the nice thing about layering your watercolor is um, the colors below show through because watercolor is transparent and then they just beautifully blend on your paper so you don't really need to blend them together you just need to layer them on top of each other and they just magically blend and they look beautiful so Practice your layering. See what colors look great together when you layer. Make your um, color swatches, your graph of your own palette so that um, you can see how your colors look like when you mix them with each other. Some colors come out really nice and some colors you might not like. Or maybe you're looking to mix um, vibrant violets but then you always get a muddy violet for example so um, it's really best if you mix your colors together and see what you get and the best thing to do that is to create a chart and now again I'm gonna add a more saturated olive green down here while the brown is still wet so that they bleed with each other and create a soft blending point okay so don't stress if you go over your sketch your line sketch okay insects are a forgiving subject
So again, I'm adding some water between the two colors. Okay, to help create that nice blending. Then again, I'm going to color lift some just to help create that velvety texture. Okay, so some paints are more granulating, like you would see it. There's more like um, soil-like look to it. So um, try to get acquainted with your different pigments, your different paints. Okay, so you know if you want some granulation or not. Okay, so this is kind of dry at top, so I'm going to add deepen the, the green. So remember, you don't have to follow the photo exactly, just um, get the basic look. Then I'm going to add water to spread it out. Okay, so do this in layers so that you can control how your work progresses. And I don't need to wait too too long for each layer to dry or things like that since um, I would actually like them to bleed a little bit with each other so that it looks soft and velvety as it should be. Okay. So now I'm going to add a light green layer here as well. Okay, I think I'm going to bring this closer so you'll see better. There. Okay, that might be better. Okay. So I'm just doing a wash over it. Then I'm going to darken it already here. Just add pigment directly from the pan. Okay, so our moth is maybe one third through. And now I'm going to go and um, add a light brown here, just light. So all the lines and texture I will do later on once everything is dry. Right now I'm focusing more on the main details, the values. So if I need to darken some parts, then the texture will come last. And then for the texture, you can you can make it as textured as you want or just um, just suggestion of texture. Yes, if you're aiming to make your work really very realistic, then of course you want to follow your reference. But I mean like, of course, it's not going to look like a photo. So it's going to look like your watercolor work. So you don't have to follow each and every tiny line for example here unless of course that's really what you're aiming for so if if you're aiming for that then um, yes you would like to follow everything and then of course um, 
for this exercise, you would need a lot of the detail brushes because there, there's a lot of lines. So something fine and small like this, for example. Okay, so it's up to you. For me, I just get, I just um, do it kind of realistic, not too, um, not too extreme, not photorealistic. Okay, because there are levels of um, realism. All right, so next um, I'm gonna add the dark spots already over here, here, here. Okay, I'm gonna add those. So I don't want I don't want it to be it, it doesn't look black. So I'm gonna mix the olive with some blue and some brown. Okay, so I'm just gonna create a really deep um, green without using black because sometimes black makes it look um, dull like it's like it's it has mattified so un unless it's really black black there are many ways that you can um, try to make your own black okay I'm gonna add some French ultramarine So you can see it here, it's already deepened the color. Okay, and then now I'm going to add a little bit of the burnt umber. Maybe get some more green. Okay, so you really have to, to try your color mixing and see if you like what you end up with. So for example, I, this is still too light for me. Um, I'm going to add some more blue, green, and brown. All of them. Okay, so I think I like this. And then I'm gonna go over and paint the spots. Okay, so if you find that you still don't like the intensity, um, you can always add another layer later on. So don't don't worry about that. And I don't really see my sketch very clearly anymore. That's fine. Okay, and then I'm going to do the other side as well. So if you don't remember where your sketch is or you don't see it clearly, just observe the drawing, the painting, and use other parts as reference. Okay, like this part, for example, this part is above this part, things like that. It's the same way that you would um, do when you're um, doing still life or you're drawing a model. To make sure that everything is where it should be, you use other parts as a guide, as reference for placement. Okay, so I'm going to go over this part because I touched it. Okay, so I'm doing it part by part because I'm also waiting for um, parts to dry. Okay, so <laughs> just um, go around your work or you can use your um, blow dryer if you'd like to hasten things. Okay, and um, now 
I'm gonna add some brown here just to deepen add depth here okay so to make your works realistic if that's what you're looking for you really have to study the values of your um, reference photo a good way to um, help you do that is to set it in if the photo you're copying from is colored then you um, set it in black and white and then when it's in black and white you can easily see the values um, better so you can um, tell them apart it's much harder when it's um, colored because of course different colors have different values and intensities so it's much harder to discern so just set, set the color to the photo to black and white and it will show you the values better so it's really very important if you're aiming to paint um, realistically all right so now that I have that done I'm gonna switch to a, a fine brush so that I can do the fine lines so let's try if this one so this is a zero 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 okay that's why it's so tiny okay so I'll be using this and I'm gonna get some green and then follow the the flow of the the lines here so this is all about texture so if you're looking to paint realistically then you'd have to do these fine lines because um, they will add to the texture of your work value as um, like light to dark so um, the best way is to create to practice your value you create uh, like a long line and divide it into nine equal parts and you try to shade from the darkest to white so you control it and it should just smoothly go from dark to white so that's the value that you're looking for and um, you see it better when it's in black and white but of course you have to translate it into color so at least you know when you do your color that this color should be darker or lighter than this part because in black and white it shows that okay so now i'm going to also use some some of this brown to add shadow here at the edge where they meet together okay so this part I'm doing the, the shadowing with a lot of lines so it's kind of like hatching you're doing some hatching on this part Then I'm also going to add some green. Okay, so take your time because this is really um, taking your time to put in the right details. Okay, so you don't have to be in a hurry. You can do this one part a day okay so if you want to make it as realistic as you want then you have to um, take your time do your observations
okay so if you feel like you've put in too much color at some point just color lift okay while it's still kind of wet it's much easier to remove and of course depending on your um, paper if it's more forgiving to color lifting Okay, so this brush is really very fine. You can really create the tiniest lines. So I'm just adding a little bit of the, the brown to add the redness that you see in the photo. Okay, so now I'm gonna work on this part. So I'm gonna wet it part by part so I can add the, the brown okay and then just spread it edge with a clean brush just add a little bit of water to the edge so that it spreads and you can also lift if it's too much okay so it's all about um, your water control so if you if you paint more then of course you're gonna get more acquainted with how to control your water how to use your brush So I'm trying to maintain the lines between. Okay. So now it's starting to look like a moth. Okay. And then I'm going to go work on this part here. I'm just going to get directly here in the pan so that the green is more intense. So I'm adding texture. Because if you see insects, they are, they're very hairy. So if you want to get it right realistically then you have to show some hairiness to the insect okay and now i'm going to add some brown darker brown here in the wings And again, I'm going to soften the edges so they look more natural. So remember, if you want your paint to spread and bloom, just wet your paper beforehand, wet that section, and when you apply the pigment, it's just going to magically bloom. So you can also control the, the shape or the size of your, of the wetness that you apply so that the, the pigment will also bloom in that section. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad it looks nice. There's, it's still a long way to go, but at least now it looks like moth. Okay, so add the 
the extra details that you see okay I'm gonna do it on the other side as well so that's the thing about moths and butterflies what you see on the other side is what you see on the other side as well so they're perfectly symmetrical so you also have to keep that in mind okay so that when you do it um, you can make them symmetrical of course depending on the angle that you see them okay and again I'm gonna soften the edges just add water to soften the edges and just dab it on your paper towel if you feel like it's too much or if it's too wet okay so you really need an absorbent material if you like to use the sponge then go ahead I'm going to add more brown here. Okay, so this is actually nice because in the reference photo, the edges of this dark brown is darker than the midsection. Mid so amazingly, the paint just bloomed that way, saving me some time. Okay, I like this color of the moth. It's just very earthy. Okay, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna work on the inner wings. I'm gonna do the the green. There's this inner part. Okay, and then it has a deep brown. So if you want your edges to remain crisp and clean, then you'll have to paint um, on dry paper, okay? So to have clean edges, crisp edges, your paper has to be dry. So just wait for it to dry or you can blow dry it if you're too impatient. But then again, the thing with blow drying is if you want some magical blooming to happen, it's going to remove that. Okay, now I'm going to go to the other side. I think we also have a video done by Theodora where she did some butterflies if I'm not wrong so if you're if you're looking to paint butterflies just look for it on our YouTube channel we have other videos there that you might want to check out and don't forget to catch Theodora's live tomorrow. It's very interesting. Okay, so I'm just going to add the lines later on. Um, now I'm just focusing on the, the colors and the shadows. And don't worry, I haven't forgotten about the background. I'm also going to do that. 
might not complete it the whole live, but um, I'll show you how I do it. Okay, so right now it's raining outside continuously for the last several days. And meanwhile, in some parts of the world, it's terribly hot. I hope the weather is okay on your side of the world. Okay, and then I'm going to add just um, some green to the edges of the wing. If you look at the, the reference, there's some slight green on the edges. So I'm going to add that. Okay, so little details like this also add to the, the realistic qualities of the work. Then on the other side as well. Oh, also there, gosh, I hope you're safe and you won't get flooded. I feel sorry for some parts that are just um, lower than other parts because, of course, the rain tends to go there. So keep safe over there. And I'm adding some of the green here. Okay, so now it's time to add some texture also here to the body. So I'm actually focusing on adding more texture to the body and the wings. For the wings later on, I'm just going to add um, the lines. Okay, so same brown that I mixed earlier, I'm going to be using for the texture of the body. So try not to uh, put your hand over the wet parts. I always make that mistake. So I'm reminding you because I have to remind myself as well. If you find it's too dark, just dilute. Okay, and I'll do it continuously. Okay, so try to vary the, the length of your lines. Just like when you're doing grass, okay, don't make them all the same length. Okay, so I like it. it, it adds quality, uh, character already. Some parts I feel like I should have made them white, so I'm just going to add gouache later to fix that. Okay, that's the magic of gouache. Okay, and then for these other parts that should be darker, I just add this darker brown that I did. So I apply that line first and then I thin it out with water. going to do to the next part as well.
actually think it should be lower so let me remove that okay so many things you can do while it's still wet oh and I have I have a new article that's coming out by tomorrow it's quite interesting because it's about um, how to paint um, watercolor on canvas so if you're wondering if it's possible to paint watercolor and canvas then you'll get your answers there it's also an interesting experience for me because I really didn't I haven't really exactly tried to paint watercolor and canvas but I tried it out and it's interesting so you might also want to try it out for yourself or maybe you're already wondering so I'm adding deeper green here and also here and a little bit on here as well okay so this is to add um, volume to the shape and then there's some shadow so I'm going to use a neutral brown to add shadow here Yes, do check it out. It's interesting. Okay. And then just the tiniest bit here. There's also some shadow. Okay, so uh, these things, they will really help your work look realistic, getting the right shadows, getting the volume and the shape right. Okay, I know um, some don't like to, to sketch, they like to trace, but I also encourage that you learn to, to draw yourself. That way you can also create your, your own original works. okay so I'm just gonna add um, texture as well to the upper part so I'm sort of outlining the part where it meets the, the white part just to not completely then adding the, the lines texture And then we also have an, an art, another article about um, color temperatures and values and things like that. So that would also be useful for you since you're looking to paint realistically. So a better understanding of 
color temperatures and also some color theory is um, very useful okay so um, I'm gonna leave the the moth for now so that I can um, do some background okay so since it's kind of dry um, there's no danger of them blending with each other so I'm gonna do background I'm gonna choose um, I'm gonna use a different palette now because I want a, a really paler um, brown so I'll go with um, raw umber because it's a cool brown I want it I want the black the brown of the background to be different from this brown okay. and then I'll be using a bigger brush so I can cover more area okay so let me get some water with my syringe it's quite useful if you want to get a load of water without having to re-dip your brush so many times okay so again I'm gonna go and use the um, raw umber So if you want to get a cool brown, then you mix, um, if you don't have brown in your palette, then you mix um, colors that are also cool, a cool blue and a cool orange, or cool red, blue, and yellow, then you're going to get a, a cooler brown. Okay, so I'm going to swatch it out to see if it's, it's a good, okay, I don't want it to be too dark, because I want just a general wash. Okay, so be careful not to cover your butterfly, your moth. That's why I applied some masking fluid to this really tiny part so that I don't have to um, go around them. It's quite easy to just paint around them because they're very fine and small. So if you do get masking fluid, what I do is I transfer it to because it's a big it's a big jar and it dries quickly. So I don't want it to to go to waste. I transfer it into a smaller container, and that's what I um, keep opening and using, so that I don't um, contaminate the big one. And later on, when you're ready to paint those parts, you just rub it off, and it will, uh, you know, it will be removed. This is one of the most used brushes in my set. It doesn't even have the the details of the size because it's been erased from too much using I'm sure you also have your favorite brushes right the brushes that you always you know don't even realize that you're just reaching for them you know them so well already their quirks like oh it's it kind of has a weird tip so if you if you get good brushes and you take care of them they can really last you your lifetime so that's the thing about investing in, in good brushes they're also very hardy as long as you take care of them okay so what I do is I have that overall yes number 10 and number six right right two favorite brushes usually a big one and a small one and then you just reach for the others if there's a specific need for them but otherwise yeah so you only really need I think at the most six brushes to start with when you're still you know trying out different techniques okay so um, 
I'm gonna wait for it to dry normally, but um, I'm gonna blow dry it now so that I can do the next part. dry enough and what I find is <laughs> I blow it when I use a blow dryer over it it gets warm and if there's some buckling you can actually like um, kind of remove it when it was heated so you just you know twist your paper your fold roll your paper like this to fix the deformation okay so now um, this is actually very detailed you don't have to be this much detailed just um, you can just get the general look of the of the work okay so I'm gonna use the rigor brush this um, with a really short brush the thing is it has it, it, if you need really fine lines it's great but then since it's very thin it won't hold much water and pigment so you'll have to be, keep redipping but with the rigor brush it's long it's fine and if you're not really making the tiniest fine lines then it will do well Okay, so this is one of the brushes that I also recommend that you have in your set if you have if you're collecting because it's quite useful. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go and mix a, a, the deeper raw umber, so a more pigmented raw umber right here. Okay, so then you can use your mixture to create all those fine lines. Okay, so let's start. I'm just going to go in with a general look. And there will be a lot of broken lines okay so that you you kind of forget the the look and feel of wood so it's not you don't really exactly see one straight line except for the big cracks but more of um, a lot of broken um, fine lines so try to get that look and feel and try to follow the same kind of grain so that's the thing about wood the grains of the wood really make it beautiful with all the texture but they follow a certain flow a certain grain so be respectful of that so that it would look realistic okay again I'm not even aiming to do the same you know very fine right next to each other I'm just getting the general feel Okay, so keep doing this until you get um, the grains that you're looking for. For some parts that are um, deeper, you can later add a deeper layer over it, or you can add more lines, for example, like how you would do in pen and ink. To make some parts darker, you just add more lines. So a lot of, of the techniques that you would use with pen and ink, you can also definitely use with watercolor. So for example, 
catching, swirling, pointillism, all those things you can um, definitely also do with watercolor. Okay, so play around with the different textures that you can create. Also with the, the depth, for example, some parts I make them darker, some parts lighter. And this is why I like the rigor brush because you can make continuous long lines without having to redip. So I'm going to darken this part now because this is also another big crack. So you will have to do this if you want it to be following the reference. Again, you can just do more bigger lines, thicker lines. You can just get the general impression of the wood. That's fine too. Okay, Don't stress about it if you don't like doing a lot of small thin lines. Though I can say it, it can be therapeutic as well. You don't really spend too much time thinking about it. It's not very mind-boggling to do. Okay, so for example, some parts you want to darken them a bit, so just go over them with a darker shade. Okay, you can still do that. So just shade it out. like so okay so I just like to get the lines out first before I add the, the shadows so it's up to you if you prefer to do the shadowing first go ahead you can do that too in my case I just like I said it, the lines can be really therapeutic so I enjoy doing them So add the shadows here and there, and then it's going to make your work look, um, the wood look more real. Okay, so continue. Continue doing that for all the, the wood parts. And... Um, Later on, it's going to look real. Okay, so I'm going to work at the parts near the, the moth. And it's important to add the shadows later because it's going to make it look like the moth is has landed on the trunk and not floating or hovering.
So which prompt of the World Watercolor Month is your favorite? I haven't really done most of the prompts, to be honest. But I can say the one that I had fun with was the, the hamburger, the savory one. So as you can see, it's impossible to finish it for today, but this is something that you can do yourself on your own. Don't worry, it's uh, not as detailed as the moth. I'll just finish this part so I can add the shadows. A oh, reflection. Oh, the very first that I did. That's not, yeah. And then the thing about reflection is you can totally use it for different landscape views, different subject matters, right? It's so useful. You can totally have fun with, with reflections. Water reflection is very varied. You can also try um, doing reflection with, um, for example, a metal that's much harder, but it's also a different kind of challenge. So now I'm going to add shadow. Just gonna get directly from the pan because this is pretty deep. Oh, reflection is such a favorite. <laughs> I'm glad because this, that was my very first and I was just like try, trying the live first time to do Facebook live as well. Oh yeah, wow, that will be so great. Very detailed but really that will be very interesting. And please share. Please share your works that you've done. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm glad that you guys learned something from me. Yes, metal is quite, it's, it's a different kind of reflection, but it's very interesting as well. Okay, and I'm also going to add on the other side, here. Okay, so, so getting your, your shadows in is also very important for your realistic works and also to, to give grounding to your subject. So especially when you're doing still life, it's important not to, to neglect your, your surface. It will, it's part of the whole um, composition. So, as you can see, I started with the lines, and when they're, and then since they're very thinly painted, they dry quite quickly. Then you can also you can already add shadowing to the parts where there's more shadow or there are parts that have um, a deeper color. OK, 
Okay. So I'm just really going to keep, I'm going to add the really dark parts just to have them there in. So for the really dark parts, um, if you don't like how deep you've made them, you feel like it's not deep enough, you can just add later on. Once it's dry, you can add another layer. You can keep adding layers. Okay. So it always depends on your paper. So if your paper is um, hot pressed, so usually that's um, that has a smoother surface. So your your pigment gets loaded on top, and at some point um, it can become too loaded if there are too many layers. And once that happens, then every time you add another layer on top, the layer below will can be lifted. So you can still add layers, but you have to be careful not to rub too much or go over too much because the layers below that um, you've already done and you've actually waited for them to dry before you piled on top can be lifted. So just be careful. With um, cold press paper, um, this is cold press, it's more textured and it also absorbs really well, like sometimes too quickly when you're still playing around and it's already absorbed. Um, it's uh, it can handle more more layers and more loading of water and pigment because it absorbs um, better. So just try out um, your hot press or cold press so you know um, how you work with each and also which one to use for your project. Sometimes you would actually prefer to use the hot press because that's what you're looking for because they also give you like really nice water effects. So um, when I first started out, I was so frustrated and it actually was just because of, of the paper. So no matter how your paints are, if you're not using how good your paints are, if, if you're not using the right kind of paper, it can really um, affect the result of your work. So. I recommend you try out um, different kinds of paper so that you can see how each one behaves and you can choose better depending on the work you're doing. Okay, so I started with just a deep brown in the middle and I just softened the sides and then pull some of the pigment and water out to create the edges, so some softened edges of the wood. Okay, so wood is very, it's very beautiful. Like I really love wood grains. And different, different kinds of wood give you different grains, different colors. I haven't actually tried to carve wood, but I think it would also be interesting. Okay, so this part will be important for your camouflage later. So just try to make sure that you put in the shadows at the right sections. Don't forget about the, the wood grain. So masking fluid is really useful for small parts where you want to you want to keep them safe from painting over them. If it's a much straighter edge, then you can also use tape, masking tape, or artist's tape, and that can, you, that can also preserve that white space that you need. Okay, so for this part, it, 
the grains aren't very visible so I'm just gonna do the shadows first and then just add the, the grains later on the ones that I see So you can see already that they're starting to um, be, be, be part of this tree, like it's sort of blending. So because of the browns of the moth, it camouflages with, with the tree. So I like to work with layers so I can better control and also so the layers when they pile on top of each other they create beautiful textures. Okay, so um, I'm going to go and get my white Pen. Okay, so I'm gonna just do the lines of the, of the moth. To add the texture of the wings. And okay, looks okay. Now I'm going to move to the other side. So I'm not drawing it too too dark, just suggestions of the lines. And I think that really helped with the look of the, the moth. And then I'm going to add here to these parts. If you want it whiter, I might, then you can use gouache. And then just Add the little parts that you feel like need some more work. Like this part with the shadow here. So adding the right shadows and details here and there. Every little bit counts. So just look at your reference, observe it, and those that you need to add that would really complete your work, then um, you should add them. So take your time, okay? And sometimes what you see today, you know, with fresh eyes tomorrow, you'll see something that you didn't really see earlier. So if you're getting frustrated, take a break and just try again another time, okay? No use getting upset over it and then you might actually end up ruining things so it's important to also take breaks so I'm adding just shadowing here and there just to help with the, the look and feel of making it more three-dimensional Mm 
then I'm going to add the whites here that I painted over that should actually be white. So, pen and go wash to the rescue. Okay, so just a little bit more and then I'll finish. So once every I've finished all the background, then I'm going to rub off this um, liquid and then it'll just come out like rubber and then you can the paper will be white and you can paint over it. Okay, so I won't finish it today, the background, because it takes time, but um, you get the general idea of what I did. And I hope that um, helped you. I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, um, ask me now before or you can still ask me later and I, I'll definitely get back to you okay so I'm gonna go and flip now and show you my face again all right okay so that's it for today um, sorry I don't I won't get to finish the background but at least you get I hope you you understood what I meant about the whole process. So you can do the shadowing first and then do the, the lines later on, or you can do what I did and do the lines and just add the shadowing later on. Okay, so it's up to you, um, depending on what works best for you. So I hope you learned something. And um, tomorrow is Theodora's turn for um, continuous lines, I think, which is very interesting. So I hope you also um, uh, stay with her for tomorrow okay so have a good day and goodbye